This morning's sermon is uh, James chapter 2. We return once again to James, uh, return uh, once again to the same text of last week, developing um, a a nuance that's quite significant for uh, the sacrament of baptism we have shared, James 2. If you find Hebrews, if you find 1 Peter, it's right there. Hebrews, James, Peter. Please ask me, please join me in asking for God's blessing. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the call to worship and for the ministry of your word and sacrament. And as you have acted in Christ to establish and renew covenant with us, we pray now that we could receive your word without distraction. Open our ears and cultivate our hearts that we would receive what you have for us. Oh, that young and old would have faith sown and strengthened within our hearts. For Jesus' sake, amen. James chapter 2, we begin reading with verse 1. This is God's word. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, And a poor man in shabby shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? which he has promised to those who love him. But you, you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So far the reading of God's word. Please be seated. Well, beloved congregation, over the last week, uh, looking forward to the sacrament of baptism this morning, I was thinking uh, that that we've been given a wonderful opportunity to consider James' appeal to baptism in our passage. Now, of course, we have heard from these same words last week uh, with the main point of this text, uh, mercy triumphs over judgment. And if you were with us then, you may remember how James develops that message of mercy, beginning with a rather intense appeal to the law, what he calls the royal law on the one hand, while proceeding to apply what he calls the law of liberty, the gospel of Jesus Christ for sinners. And so then, the message that James is ministering to us here is the mercy of God, that the mercy of God has come to you with the implication then that as we have received mercy, we would share mercy. The point today, the point for this morning, is that as James proclaims this message of mercy, he reinforces that message with an appeal to baptism. An appeal to baptism in the words of chapter 2, verse 7 the honorable name by which you have been called, the honorable name by which you were called. It is a unique appeal. 
It's a unique appeal, no doubt about it. And if you're like me, baptism doesn't immediately jump off the text as you read through it. It doesn't become an explicit part of the message as it does in other Bible passages. For example, in Romans 6, where the Apostle Paul um, presents baptism as a picture of our union with Christ in his death and our union with Christ in the glory of his resurrection. Or again, how Paul in Ephesians 4 Uh, appeals to baptism as that which signifies not only our union with Christ, also our union together as a church. For there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, he says. And again, in Colossians 2, where baptism is pictured as the fulfillment of the promises formally signified and sealed in circumcision. And so it goes, the ministry of Paul. His method is not hard to see, a method of ministry that is very much an Old Testament, New Testament development of doctrine. Whereas with Jesus and James following Jesus, there is a much more subtle appeal to Old and New Testament doctrines. For example, as Jesus engages with Nicodemus, he assumes that Nicodemus has has a clear understanding of what God had formally revealed through the, the promises and psalms and prophets of the Old Testament. And, is, and Jesus is rather uh, put off that, that Nicodemus can't draw from that, right? Remember? So also James... More times than not, James assumes a basic foundational knowledge of God's Word, and his preference is uh, really a more explicit call to action, rather than a kind of old New Testament development of doctrine we see in Paul, James, his preference is a more explicit call to action. We see it in our passage where James assumes that the church would immediately identify his appeal, his appeal to the honorable name by which you have been called to baptism, an appeal to Christian baptism, and that the church would likewise then understand the very natural impulse to respond accordingly. But today, these words, I think, need some explanation. Uh, They certainly did for me over the past week, and I'm assuming they probably do for you. We need a bit of explanation as to what's going on here. So, So let's look at how James' unique appeal to baptism here is developed with reference to an honorable name. Uh, an honorable name. Remember again that James' broader concern is that the churches, he's concerned that the churches are showing uh, partiality in a way that favored the rich. The rich were in that time and place a, a group of people who were opposing Christianity. And so we might summarize uh, James' concern saying that, why would you favor the people who are opposing you and neglect the people who like you? That's really what, where, where, where James is going. Although, in that summary, we haven't gone far enough. In fact, it's not quite accurate to say that James warns us of people who oppose us. We need to be more precise. The message that he is bringing to us is not about those who oppose you or me, but those who oppose God. Verse 7. They are the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called. 
these opponents of the honorable name to which you were called. Now, if you have a study Bible, you can notice the cross references that are noted in your Bible. What's not noted there, however, is I think maybe one of the most important Old Testament texts, the naming of number six. The naming of number six. Remember that? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. This threefold name of the Lord, the most holy and honorable name of God himself, a reminder to old Israel of the covenant and calling that they had received, a covenant and calling that Isaiah remembers in his prophecy. A covenant and calling that is simply summarized as the name. Isaiah 63, verse 19, Isaiah laments there that Israel had forgotten. He says that we have become like those whom the Lord did not know, like those who are not called by your name like those who are not called by your name. And again, in Isaiah 65, the Lord now, he speaks, saying, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, the Lord speaking, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. You see the pattern. This calling and covenant with God that was, that was set apart by his name. In Amos chapter 9, verse 12, God speaks there of a day when he would raise up his people. Not simply from the nation of Israel, but from all the nations and peoples of the world referred to as the remnant of mankind and all the nations who are called by my name, that they too may seek the Lord. Not merely Old Covenant Israel, but all who are called by my name, says the Lord. It brings so much light into what Jesus is doing in Matthew 28, doesn't it? As Jesus... uh, shows himself to be a fulfillment of that promise, a promise that is signified and sealed in baptism and the ministry of the church. He says, go and make disciples of who? Of all nations, baptizing them in the name, into the name, not the names now, but the threefold name, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is immediately associated with the name, the covenant, and the calling that God extends to his people. And we find that in Acts 15. And Acts 15 is the famous Jerusalem Council, uh, just as an interesting side note. Uh, that's where we get basis for our synod meeting next week. The the, the assembly of the saints, the Jerusalem council that took place then. And in Acts 15, as they deliberate over opportunities and challenges before the churches, James stands up among them. This is our James now. He stands up among them, and he specifically cites Amos 9 and proclaims its truth regarding the name of the Lord saying that the remnant of mankind may now seek the Lord, and all who are called by my name declares the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. If we can take a breath a moment and connect some of the dots, 
what we find is that the name of the Lord was placed upon an old Israel through the promise of his word. The name of the Lord was placed upon old Israel through the ministry of his word and confirmed through the sign of circumcision. Now, the name of the Lord is placed upon his church through the ministry of his word, signified and sealed in the sign of baptism. Circumcision gives way to baptism. And as James proclaims in Acts 15, so again he proclaims in our passage the honorable name by which we have been called. The honorable name by which we have been called in baptism. That's the truth of baptism. You did not seek God, but he came seeking you. You did not call out to God, but he came calling out to you. And in, in James' unique appeal to baptism then, and this reference to the honorable name, James is saying to us, remember, remember how the Father came to you and the Son and has called you in the Spirit. And remember that this is an effectual call. It is a, an irrevocable call. We might illustrate this from the Scriptures. In the beginning, for example, God called, let there be light. There was light, and it was separated from the darkness. God continues to speak, remember? Calling Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Calling Abraham in Genesis 12. He calls Israel out of the darkness in Egypt. A calling and covenant marked by circumcision. Circumcision. A sign of blood that reminds us that God's calling and covenant is irrevocable, accompanied with blessings and curses. Think about the blessing and curse of Genesis 3, the first promise of grace and that covenant. Think of the blessing to Abraham and the curse that lingered upon the nations around him, Sodom and Gomorrah. Think of the blessing to Israel and the curses that fell upon Egypt. Jacob I loved. Esau, I hated. Maybe a further illustration could be when, uh, well, I've been told that my dad was uh, drafted into the military kind of a long time ago now. And it's been reported to me that when that draft, when that call comes, it is effectual, it is irrevocable. The governing authorities have spoken, the law has been evoked. And uh, my dad had a choice. He could live in obedience to the command or disobedience. Uh, Christian baptism reminds us that we have been drafted. Christian baptism reminds us that God has come and called us to be, to be in the kingdom of Christ to be engaged in the struggle and spiritual battle, the various powers and principalities of this present evil age. It is effectual, it is irrevocable. Baptism signifies the greatest of blessing for those who receive it in faith. And it is a picture of judgment for those who do not. Either Christ will be our sovereign Lord and Savior, or Christ will be our sovereign Lord and judge. 
The waters of baptism are a flood of judgment outside of Christ, but that same baptism is a flood of mercy in Christ, where mercy triumphs over judgment. That's what we heard in the and the questions related to baptism this morning, isn't it? Do you despise yourself because of your sin and look only to Jesus Christ as your Savior? We develop that same truth further in our catechism, question answer 60, how are you right with God? And kids, you know this. Only by true faith in Jesus Christ even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against God and his commandments, even though I have never kept any one of them, and while I am still inclined towards all evil, nevertheless, without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me, to me, (laughs) even me, he grants the perfect satisfaction, the perfect righteousness, He grants the perfect holiness of Christ. Now listen to this. So that God looks upon me. Do you have this assurance? That God looks upon me as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner. Indeed, he sees me as having been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need do is to accept this gift with a believing heart. That, you see, is the truth of baptism. That's what James appeals for the church to remember. To remember that in Christ, mercy triumphs over judgment. And may the same be said of us as Grace Church. In Grace Church, the mercy of Christ triumphs over judgment. Amen. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the word that you have given to us, your written word and your preached word. We pray now that you would bless all that is from you, that we would grow more in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray as well that you would spare us from all that is not. Oh, that you would spare us from the the errors of man, the sins of men and women, whether it be the imaginations of my own heart or whether that may be the festering of sin within our souls. Oh, that we may bring our cares and our anxieties. Oh, that we may bring the greatest of sins to the least, to Jesus Christ and the cross. And may we find in his blood the power to be washed clean. May we find in the cross of Jesus Christ the power to be justified, the power to be completely sanctified, May we find in Christ and his resurrection the living hope that we need from day to day. Father, we pray that we would remember our baptism this morning, that we would cultivate our profession of faith, and that we would grow in these things from the youngest of us to the oldest, that we too would be light among the nations. For Jesus' sake, amen.